that's overlap as we go along, but there's going to be some real common threads that's not accidental. But what's interesting and fun about this reading is that N.T. Wright is going to look at Aristotle and say, yes, there's some really good things here that uh, we should glean. And he thinks that they're Christian, they're, they're biblical. Again, the New Testament is being written in a Greek world, right? A Roman world that has been influenced by Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and that tradition. And so it's had a heavy influence in Christianity. And the Bible's written, the New Testament's written in Greek. So he talks about there being a lot of good things about what Aristotle is saying. And uh, early Christians um, used Aristotle's model of virtue. But there are also significant differences and places where Christian character, Christian virtue, Christian formation is different. And so as you're reading and going through the next two weeks, I want you to be thinking about that. Where is there significant overlap between this and Aristotle? But where is there difference? What's different about Christian virtue, Christian character? Also, of course, I want you to be thinking, do you agree? Do you disagree? Just because you're reading these things in class, I hope you don't feel obligated to agree with what you're reading. Um, Hopefully there's some things that resonate with you and maybe other things that you want to question, but that creates really good dialogue on discussion boards and other things. So uh, this is going to be pretty short, um, just kind of an introduction to what you've been reading. I'm going to highlight a few points um, and hopefully stimulate you know, some thought. So the first, the, sort of the introduction, this first question, right, N.T. Wright raises, is, what am I here for, right? Okay, great, I'm a Christian. Now what? Um, my soul saved is my job now to sort of wait until I die so that my soul can go to heaven. Um, am I here just to sort of tell as many people about my own testimony as possible so maybe I can help them go to heaven? Um, what is the real purpose now? What am I here for? So N.T. Wright makes the argument, and it's sort of a book-length argument in some respects, that Christians are here. Um, in some respect, to have our hearts transformed and to have our character formed into the likeness of Christ. I'm Christian, great, now what? Now is the moment where we, the process, the, the lifelong process of having our character transformed, cultivating virtue, this notion of Christ-likeness and whatnot. And so the quote that uh, I, I pulled out from Wright's book here, character, the transforming, shaping, and marking of a life and its habits will generate the sort of behavior that rules might have pointed toward, but which a rule-keeping mentality can never achieve. So, again, we've talked about rule-based ethics versus character-based ethics. N.T. Wright's making an argument that we're Christian, and now we've been moved, we accept Christ, we accept that forgiveness, and now we're here to not only share our story and our testimony, but also to cultivate a particular kind of character. You can agree or disagree with that, but this is his response to a very big question for Christians. And he sort of contrasts this notion of character development with rules. And we've talked about this some, so I don't want to go too far into it. But he says too often Christians uh, and too often churches get wrapped up in a rule-based mentality. Here's a list of rules to follow. This is what it means to be Christian. If you break one of the rules, you need to be punished in some way, or there needs to be repercussions. But often it never goes from that, which can, rules can be very important, but it never goes from that into cultivating their own character. And he highlights an example of the economic collapse in 2008. And the argument, and I tend to agree with it here, no matter how many rules you put in place for banks, mortgage companies, lenders and those citizens taking out loans, no matter how many regulations you put in place, no matter how many rules you put in place to try to keep it in line, people will find a way to get past the rules, to bend them, find loopholes, break them. We see it all the time in the tax code. We, there are all kinds of examples where this stuff occurs. So you can try to continue to make rules, but that doesn't address the real issue. And Wright argues the real deficit was a deficit in character. People letting greed 
get in the way of what's right. Putting self-interest ahead of common social interest, right? Putting their own advantage above fairness. And until we begin to change the character of those people running banks, giving mortgages, until the character changes of those people taking out loans, things won't change. Because it's not just investment banks, and it's not just Wall Street, and it's not just people, mortgage lenders. It's also citizens who take out loans they don't intend to pay back or that they really can't pay back. It's, it's citizens walking away from their homes, letting them foreclose because they, you know, they don't have any equity in them or, or it's depreciated so much. This is a whole system in place, but no amount of rules can solve it. It's got to be about character. I think there's something right. You know, in my own life, I've told you I love baseball. And so one of the things that baseball has sort of endured over the last decade or so is the steroid scandal. And so often when they talk to old players who either have acknowledged doing it or have tested positive, you know, they'll talk about how there was no rule in baseball against taking steroids. Not, there was no policy in place. Although steroids, of course, were illegal in our country, the athletes knew that it was giving them an unfair advantage. They knew it was taboo. No one wanted to talk about it or make it public. So they can talk about there not being a rule, but that's not really the point. The point is you had a particular kind of character that was willing to cheat. You didn't seem to care about that. You didn't care about justice and even playing field fairness, integrity, honesty. So until the character changes, no matter how many rules we put in place, it seems that they'll still just be violated. So we, at some point, there's got to be a transition. Certainly, children need rules. Adolescents need rules. But how do we transition from that to character that's so vital? So here are a few things N.T. Wright, a few claims N.T. Wright makes. I happen to agree, but you may disagree, and this might make for an interesting conversation. I don't know. So N.T. Wright argues, the cultivation, the cultivation of Christian character is about becoming fully human. It really is about becoming fully human. That's what we're doing between the time we've accepted our salvation till we pass on to whatever the next reality holds, right? We are here to become fully human, the humans God intended us to be. This is what virtue entails. We are called to reflect God's image to the world. Right? As Wesleyans, we believe we've been created in the image of God to the extent that we model God to the world, we reflect God's image. To the extent that we do not model God to the world, we hide that image. And so we're called to sort of reflect God's image to the world. A life spent submitting to God is the abundant life that Jesus talks about. Right? This is human flourishing. And so just like Aristotle, N.C. Wright makes this connection between virtue and human flourishing. We often think that morality is here to thwart our happiness. Oh, man, I, I want to have sex with as many people as I want, but, you know, there's that rule about no premarital sex. There's that rule about, you know, being faithful to my wife, not committing adultery. And so it, it's thwarting me from doing what I really want to do. It would really make me happy. You know, I'd love to eat eight pieces of chocolate cake, but there's that whole rule about not overeating and gluttony. Well, N.T. Wright and Aristotle both argue, well, this is just a wrong view. You can't really flourish. You can't really be happy. You can't participate into what God calls the abundant life unless you develop virtue, unless you cultivate character. Right? The abundant life is serving God. Right? We just have to see it that way. Of course, part of the problem is, right here, we can't see this until our hearts and our desires start to be formed and transformed by the Holy Spirit. So we can't see that this really is the abundant life until our desires start to be shaped into the likeness of Christ. We can't see that this is human flourishing, real human flourishing, until the transformation process begins. And so, we cultivate character at the beginning, at least, based on faith, for N.T. Wright. We trust that this is the abundant life. Even though it doesn't feel like it, even though it feels like a bunch of oppressive rules, we try to live into it in faith, but as I'm being shaped into the likeness of Christ, as I begin to image Christ to the world, my desires change, my perspective changes, and suddenly I realize this is the best way to live. This is the abundant life. 
if we could just sell people on that, right? If we could just convince our congregations of that, it might make a giant difference, right, in the way we live. So N.T. Wright gives a really uh, long uh, analysis of the rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus and says, what do I need to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, you know, he talks about the Ten Commandments and loving thy neighbor, and the man says, you know, look, I've done these things. I know the law. I, I'm seeking you. I'm asking the right questions. I've been doing the things I'm supposed to do. And then Jesus says, you know, okay, well then give everything to the poor. Give all that you have away. And of course we know the story. The rich and ruler goes away very sad and disappointed because he had great wealth. And the idea is, man, Jesus is trying to take this rich young guy's happiness away. Give all your money away. Right? This is kind of a rule. One way to look at it is a rule that this young man is supposed to follow. A rule that is getting in the way of his comfort and his happiness. And N.T. Wright says this is the wrong way to look at this. And I agree. Jesus is saying, do you, want, do you really want to participate in the abundant life? Do you really want to know what it means to pursue God? Give away your possessions because the less attached you are to your things, to your possessions, the happier you'll be. The more able you will be to follow God and to be, to be obedient, to be that servant that God is asking us to be. The more we free ourselves from the constraints of cars, houses, insurance, locks, right? The bigger stuff we have, the better protection we need. The concerns and stress and worry of all of the material Right, abundance that we've been sort of that we sort of have as members of the United States. All of this traps us. Real happiness comes from saying, "This is not mine. This is God's. This doesn't belong to me. It all is a gift." And the moment we begin to live with an open hand, we start to live into the abundant life. We start to recognize generosity is better than greed. Living simply is better than wealth. Right? Do we really believe that? Can we start to live that way on trust, on faith, hoping, trusting that over time our perspective will change, our desires, our wants will change, and we'll begin to see the way the world the world the way God sees it, feel about the world the way God feels about it. So I don't think this is a rule for the young ruler to follow, but rather Jesus really showing him what Christian character looks like and what the abundant life looks like. Here's a quote from N.T. Wright as well. Anytime you see a, a sentence like this, you want to highlight it. Right? And the point of this book is to suggest that the dynamic of virtue, in this sense, practicing the habits of heart and life that point toward the true goal of human existence, lies at the heart of the challenge of Christian behavior. I italicize this notion, right? Practicing the habits of heart and life that point toward the true goal of human existence. That's so vital. What is the true goal of human existence? What is our ultimate telos, right? Is it the same for Christians as it was for Aristotle? Is it different? What do you think? What does N.T. Wright say, right? We haven't really got there yet, but it's beginning to unfold a little bit. What is this ultimate telos? Because it's so vital. It's key. The ultimate aim determines where our focus is as Christians and as a church. Then we have to figure out what small steps, what local telai, will help us achieve that ultimate telos. So it not only sets our gaze and our aim, but it also will establish what virtues, what practices, what habits, what exemplars do we look to to help us actually get to that ultimate goal. Without a telos, I don't know what to aim at. I don't know what direction to head in. I don't know how to evaluate behavior as moral or immoral. A telos lets me know, did my action hit the mark or miss the mark? So we've got to get clear on that. Is the Christian telos the same, right, as this sort of ancient Greek telos? And so we'll be talking some about that. He then moves into chapter 2, and you've read some of chapter 2 for this week and the rest of, or for Monday, I believe. You'll be reading some other, uh, other parts of chapter 2 for Tuesday. He highlights Aristotle's three steps. We've already talked about this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but the three steps are important. He sort of breaks down 
this virtue methodology, the method for developing virtue, first aim at the right goal. What's the telos? We've got to figure that out. Two, figure out the steps needed to reach the goal. How am I going to get to that ultimate telos? Right? Three, make the steps we're using to get to the telos habitual or second nature. We practice, practice, practice so that it becomes part of who we are and comes out naturally. This is the three-step process. Very important. I hope this helps simplify things for you and maybe crystallizes some things for you. One more thing I'll point out from this section, this early section. He talks about the four cardinal virtues according to Aristotle. So these are not necessarily according to Christianity, but certainly according to Aristotle. Uh, cardo in Latin means hinge. Um, virtuous character, human flourishing, etc. hinge on these four virtues. Uh, Aristotle will also argue the other virtues all hinge on developing these four. Without these four, we cannot develop the others. So they're sort of hinge virtues or cardinal virtues. Prudence, which means practical judgment or wisdom. This is a virtue about knowledge, knowing what you ought to do, determining virtue from vice. Right? This is practical wisdom. But it's not a virtue that actually enables me to do something about it. It's a virtue that's related to knowledge, an intellectual virtue. If you remember, Aristotle separates moral virtues from intellectual virtues. Prudence is an intellectual virtue. It gives me knowledge about right and wrong. Courage, the strength to do that, um, which I may be afraid of, to act in the face of fear. Temperance, which is balance or moderation in thought, feeling, and action, self-control, restraint, um, very important. And then, of course, justice, which we read about. So look at these and then think, how might these virtues differ from a Christian set of virtues? What, what might be the cardinal virtues with regard to Christianity? Would they be the same? Some overlap? No overlap? N.C. Wright, again, will talk about this as we approach run through the book, but I'm curious to get you thinking about this. What do you think about these virtues? Right? At the end of today's reading, N.T. Wright looks at Aristotle's three-step process and says, you know, these are good steps, but they're two-dimensional. He gives an analogy. They're like two-dimensional. Christianity embraces the methodology Christianity ought to, the New Testament, he argues, embraces the methodology, but it turns this two-dimensional view into a three-dimensional view, a fuller notion of the steps, and N.T. Wright thinks a more Christian notion. Vital section on page 36, you've got to highlight that and look at it. N.T. Wright says, look, Aristotle talks about establishing a telos. Christianity agrees. But with Aristotle, what you have is individuals striving after a telos to cultivate individual virtue. He highlights the individual a little too much. Aristotle does think that we play a greater role into the polos. We do this for our, to play our role in community. But N.T. Wright says, but there's no notion of the sense of God's grace equipping us towards the telos. There's, there's no sense in which, right, for Aristotle, that we're participating into the coming kingdom that God will establish on earth as it is in heaven. So there's a more robust sense of what our telos is in Christianity. This is just part of the difference between the two for N.T. Wright. Virtues. Here again he says, there are virtues that Aristotle articulates that he agrees with, but they're not fully compatible with the Christian set of virtues. So when you talk about humility and love, forgiveness, these are not part of the Greek world that was focused on courage and pride and strength. And so maybe there's a different set of virtues going on here, right? And then, of course, habits. If we have a different set of virtues, then ha habituation is going to be vital, but it'll be a different set of habits to cultivate a different set of virtues. So we're going to be unpacking that as we go along. I hope this has helped and stimulated some thoughts. Um, if you have any questions, let me know, and I'll look forward to seeing you online.